Hi, my name is James Gurney and welcome to my studio. So how do I balance art, science, and imagination? Well, to me, they're all closely related. They're different forms of inquiry. Science through the mind, art through the heart. But they all are going after the same thing and they all use imagination to get there. Now, a lot of my work falls under the category of what I would call imaginative realism. That's painting a realistic picture of something that doesn't exist or something you can't see. So that would include science fiction and fantasy and paleo art where you're reconstructing extinct animals or historical paintings. Anything where you have to imagine something, sketch it out and develop whatever techniques you can for making it real. Well, I didn't come initially to dinosaurs when I was developing Dinotopia. I kind of went in through the door of Lost Worlds. I had been working as an illustrator for National Geographic magazines, so my job for them was to travel to the site of ancient Lost Worlds and then reconstruct those in realistic paintings. But it was there that I got the idea to paint first a city called Waterfall City, built on the, in the center of a huge waterfall. And then after that, a dinosaur parade, a parade of people and dinosaurs. And from that came the idea of a map and a whole world uh, that I could explore in a fantasy uh, illustrated book. But once I got hooked on dinosaurs, uh, I was completely fascinated. The science had changed uh, since I was a kid, and now dinosaurs are seen as more uh, nimble, warm-blooded, and now covered with feathers. All the theories have changed, and that makes them a lot more exciting for me as an artist to try to bring them back to life. I find painting from life really helps my imaginative work because it feeds me with ideas, with lighting ideas and color schemes and textural ideas. The problem of painting on location is the opposite problem of painting from imagination, I find, because when I'm working on location, what I have to do is simplify, get rid of detail, cut it down to the essentials, and uh, try to reduce it to a simple statement. But when I'm working from my imagination, I'm starting with a blank canvas, and what I have to do is add details to create forms. I also do a lot of sketching, both in pencil and watercolor and colored pencils. Uh, and this is a faster way of working on location, capturing people on the run, or what I call portable portraits, where I draw pictures of strangers. Uh, and I do a lot of animal sketches. All of these build ideas for forms, whether I'm drawing a dinosaur or inventing an alien, uh, or developing an, uh, an imaginary city, I go through my sketchbooks and try to uh, just draw from those to get ideas. Scientific accuracy is really important to me. So I go to museums, I try to keep up to date with the latest scientific journals, and I sketch from fossils. Uh, because I want my di the dinosaurs that I paint to look as realistic according to contemporary science as I can. Where I take liberties, of course, is by developing dinosaurs as sentient creatures who can think and communicate on a par with humans. In that respect, Dinotopia is an imaginary work. Um, but there again, I try to visualize how creatures from our own world, like uh, dolphins or whales, uh, or elephants communicate and try to overestimate dinosaurs rather than underestimate them. The one thing I didn't want to do was to have the dinosaurs all talking. There are only a few dinosaurs, the ceratopsian dinosaurs, the ones with the parrot-like bill, are able to speak human languages. The rest of them speak a lot of different other kinds of ways. A lot of times in fantasy where dinosaurs are combined with human cultures, it's barbarians or cavemen. But I wanted to do the opposite, go the opposite direction, and show highly developed civilizations that had formed around dinosaurs. So 
giant Art Nouveau barns, for example, or buildings that are based on the design of plant forms. Uh, and in the ancient world of Dinotopia, I wanted to explore a high-tech world where they had developed uh, sciences to, and technology to the level of uh, sentient robots uh, and mech vehicles called strutters. I wanted to uh, visualize a world where not everything was perfect, where there's conflict and struggle and sacrifice. Uh, there's a taste of that in the book that I wrote and illustrated called First Flight where we follow the adventures of a young man who's the first to fly on the back of a Quetzalcoatlus, uh, but where he takes on some of the challenges that Dinotopia faced then. So it's a utopian world, but it had some very challenging origins thousands of years ago. Yes, absolutely. Uh, my work is intended for all ages. And the books that inspired me as a kid and now uh, are the books that were not written for a certain age group. Uh, books like Treasure Island, uh, or the books of Mark Twain, uh, or H.G. Um, Wells, or Jules Verne. All of these classic books were written before someone got the bright idea of carving up publishing into a bunch of age categories. I think every book should have a shallow end and a deep end, just like any good swimming pool. There should be some aspects of the book that are completely accessible to all ages and other parts of the book that require more serious thought and consideration. In my own experience as an author, some of my best readers, my most demanding readers, are the ones that are, that are between about age 12 and age 18. Uh, they have more time, more focus, and they notice inconsistencies, and they demand the very best of books. A Dinotopia is just one of several fantasy worlds that I've developed and that I'm in the process of developing, but it's the most special one for me because it encompasses so much. In terms of subject matter, it's everything from landscapes to cityscapes to creatures to vehicles to architecture, uh, close-ups, uh, and as a writer, it gives me a challenge uh, to develop characters over uh, the course of their lives and the arcs that they follow and to develop this world geographically in all of its scope but also historically and to delve back into its early days. But for me there will always be this interaction between the observed world and the imagined world. And at heart I'm a realist even though I'm also a fantasist. Robert Louis Stevenson once said Romance, if it is to be art, must be made gritty and pedestrian. And I think what he was trying to say is that we have to find in our dream worlds something of clay and dirt and bones, something that's basic, that's commonplace. And that's what I look for in the world around me when I'm drawing what I see, are the ordinary things that we easily overlook. And those are the qualities that I try to infuse in my imaginary worlds. Because if we really want to live in a world that we create through paintings and words, we have to believe every aspect of it, from its metaphysics to its mechanics. Hi, my name is James Gurney. Welcome to my studio. Cut, cut. We don't need the smoke machine. Forget it.